William Greider, author of Secrets of the Temple. Your book is subtitled, How the Federal Reserve Runs the Country. Have we been wrong to think it was the politicians all along? At least half wrong, yes. Uh, strange as that seems. The, uh, without going into all the esoterica of what the Federal Reserve, the central bank, actually does, in the largest frame, it regulates money and interest rates, and that is, a, is one of the most immediate and powerful influences that the government has over the real economy, workers, producers, stores, etc., simply by manipulating the price of money, which inevitably changes the price of almost every other transaction. And it's insulated from the politicians quite deliberately. So, yes. Your, the uh, notes on the book jacket suggest that in some ways the Federal Reserve is, I'm quoting the jacket now, is more secretive than the CIA and more powerful than the President and Congress. Is that really sounds, the case? Sounds grandiose, I know, but I think that's right. I, I, I thought about that a long time. And it, it is like the CIA in many ways in that it's run by a community of experts, technocrats, who, who have skills and knowledge which are not generally... Uh, available. Its secrecy is, is even greater than the CIA's in the sense that the CIA at least has to go to the Congress on a fairly regular basis, share its plans with the Congress, albeit in secret meetings of the Intelligence Committee, get an annual appropriation, which is a powerful lever. If Congress doesn't like what the CIA is doing in Nicaragua, it says, thou shalt not spend money for this. The Federal Reserve has none of those controls. The Federal Reserve is required to testify uh, regularly before Congress, but it is not required to reveal its secret delibera deliberations or uh, even its, its real uh, expectations uh, for what's going to happen to the economy. And more importantly, it makes its own budget. It does not submit to the appropriations process that every other agency of government must submit to. And as the Federal Reserve well understands, that's real power uh, and real protection from, from uh, both presidents and Congress. Does it, is that power something that evolved, uh, or was it given that power from day one? Yeah, I think, it, well, it did evolve, and I, I, you know, who knows, but it's, it survived for 75 years without any really fundamental uh, reforms that took away its, its independence. On the other hand, it's hard to believe that if you created this animal today and submitted it to Congress, that they would approve it in its present form. What happened is that it was created back in 1913 with what people believed at the time were fairly limited and mechanical functions. There was rigidities in the money supply which produced periodic catastrophes, and the idea was to create a, a more flexible system that would uh, that could feed in into the money supply uh, periodically to to just become more elastic was the phrase they used at that time what the fed discovered uh, quite haltingly over a period of two decades was that the power to do that was really the power to manipulate the whole economy uh, and that is to stimulate or restrain uh, and that its actions fed directly into interest rates in financial markets all over the place and from financial markets into the transactions of labor, business, consumers, and so forth. Uh, that wasn't instant knowledge on anybody's part. And as they grasped that, um, nobody had sufficient cause to say, well, wait a minute, that ought to be done by somebody else or it ought to be done in a more democratic manner. And in addition, um, I think both political parties understood that this is really the fulcrum between debtors and creditors, between the people with a lot of wealth and the people with none, between labor and capital. It's a very deep political transaction that goes on in this management of money. And so the compromise, which was struck in 1913, held over, the, over many years. Uh, I mean, there have been many fluctuations in that, but basically no one since, and the, and the Fed has had critics on both sides, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democratic, but no one since has ever been able to put together a powerful enough coalition to, to undo it. Another quote from your book, you say, 
The Federal Reserve System was the crucial anomaly at the very core of representative democracy. Why, why was it an anomaly and why has it become so crucial? Well, it's an anomaly. It's an anomaly because our civic mythology tells us that the people are sovereign, that the people ultimately choose their representatives, and that those representatives must be accountable at regular times. That's why we have elections every two years for the federal government, every four years for the president. The Federal Reserve is exempt from that process, and yet it has enormous political power. Now, those who believe the mythology would say, oh, well, that's not quite right because this is just a technical function. It's not politics. Well, when I, I mean, I think that's rubbish uh, because it's political in the sense that here is an agency making very large public choices for us that will reward some interests and damage other interests. That may not be their motive in doing it, but that's the result. That's, that's political in the deepest meaning of the word. Uh, and, and when you go behind the economics of the Fed and, and look at what, you know, which choices they make, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, what you, really under, what you really come to see is that these are choices of values. Paul Volcker had a certain set of values which he brought to government and, and imposed quite successfully. Um, and you can argue that the country on the whole supported those values. But the people who were damaged, the victims from both the deep recession and from, from the money, money policy that followed, have no access to express their grievances. There's no recourse. I mean, they can, they can write angry letters to the Fed, which they do, or they can call their congressman, and their congressman is likely to tell them, well, yes, isn't the Fed terrible, uh, but we can't do anything about it. And, and all I'm suggesting is that there's, there's something wrong in a system that's, that's sequestered with that much power. Then I would just add in passing, the word anomaly stops people. And I first heard that used by a former president of uh, a Federal Reserve Bank. <laughs> I mean, they understand that perfectly, they, that, it, that it's an anomalous situation. And they defend it for, for lots of different reasons. But. You mentioned Paul Volcker, and your book focuses on him quite a bit. In, in your book, you say that uh, his appointment was the most important appointment of Jimmy Carter's presidency. And, and you have a line in there, Paul Volcker would go on to seize control of events and force them in a direction of his own choosing. How is one person able to do that? Well, the institution of the Federal Reserve, but he, he provided the leadership. And what happened uh, in very simple terms was that inflation in the summer of 1979 was running well into double digits. Uh, there was a lot of uh, sort of runaway speculative buying of art, real estate. Gold was going toward $850 an ounce. And the Carter administration w was deep in its own political problems, but including a, a kind of sense of confusion about what to do about any of this. Carter appoints Volcker in July, August of 79. Two months later, despite objections and, and uh, pleas from the White House, he imposes in October 6, 1979, a new a uh, monetarist regime at the Fed, which, which is, without going into the complications, basically said, we're going to hold the money supply at a steady string level, regardless of what happens to interest rates, knowing, of course, that interest rates would go through the roof, and also really regardless of what happens to the real economy. And that's power. And, uh, and Carter was in such a weakened position at that point in his presidency that even though they didn't like it at the White House, they could not object. I mean, it was a very subtle political transaction, but everybody involved knew what was happening. Your book starts in the late 70s, but it gets into the 80s during the Reagan administration, and President Reagan came in on a, on a large wave of popularity. And yet, your book goes on to say that the awkward political secret of the 80s is that while the public blamed Reagan, it was Volcker who was actually running the economy. Even President Reagan was, was unable to affect Fed policy. Yeah, and, and there are two elements to that. Volcker's objective, which is to hold things down, including uh, presumably a recession, until this upward curve of inflation is broken. He is, he is in the midst of that without having made much progress when Ronald Reagan comes to office. 
And Ronald Reagan introduces an alluring uh, but contradictory idea of how this can be done. He says, we will stimulate the economy with these huge tax cuts, increased defense spending, so forth. And that's going to make everybody robust and healthy again. At the very time, we urge the Federal Reserve to go further and do, do exactly what Paul Volcker wants to do, which is to tighten money. Now, you don't have to be an economist to understand that there's something wrong in that formulation. How do you get, go up with an economy at the very time you're holding it down? And then that set up a collision between the Fed and the rest of government that is endured to this day. And it literally is a collision of purposes. Uh, uh, and I, I call it a phrase I borrowed from a Fed economist. It's a game of chicken between the two sides of government. And, and Volcker really won that game <laughs> with, I think, disastrous consequences, but, I mean, or at least uh, severe damage. But in any case, as a matter of will, as a matter of political strength and fortitude and skill, he won. The, and, and when you got past the recession of 1981-82, then the White House, particularly looking forward to the 1984 election, changes its, its outlook dramatically and says, for God's sakes, get out of the way with uh, tight money. Let's just let this economy roar. And that's when, that's when Volcker and Reagan are, are really in very direct conflict. It's, it's played out in sort of oblique public terms so that there's it's not the sort of argument and battle that you see in Congress where the White House says one thing and the House Speaker says something uh, contrary, to, and, and you, you have a public argument. These are, these are much more subtle, and you have to really know the language of discourse before you can follow the outline of the argument. But it's a very serious argument, and, and, uh, and basically Volcker won. This collision you talked about, is that solely based on the personalities involved, or is this going to be, in, is this institutionalized with us for years to come? Well, I think it's institutionalized, and I, and I hope this is what people get out of my book. It's not about was Paul Volcker a good guy or a bad guy, or even whether Ronald Reagan was smart or dumb, or whether his policies made any sense. It's, it's I, what I saw in my long study of this, this whole area is that we have this we have the government designed in a way that guarantees this collision one way or another and what it produces is not stability which was the original idea you know the, we'd have this balance where the fed gets strict and holds things back congress and the president are the boomers and they want to go forward and so these two would sort of balance out that isn't what happens what happens in real history is that one side gets control and goes to an extreme then the other side gets control and it goes to an extreme. And if you think back over the last 25 years, that's what's happened in our government. Uh, first we had this sort of Congress and a, and a series of presidents, not just Lyndon Johnson, but a number of his successors, who really want to do more than they can pay for and so forth and so on. They want to fight wars or whatever. And that produces a decade or more of runaway inflation. Then the Fed finally gets control, and once they're on top, they won't let go. And instead of going for a more gradual, balanced amelioration of, of inflation, they drive things really hard, really down hard. And, and that has consequences, which we are still faced with. I mean, it starts in Iowa, if you, in the most obvious sense, but it's also Mexico, which is in deep trouble and a lot of corporations that are in deep trouble, not to mention consumers. But the, my, my argument in the book is that you've got to find some mechanism to, to marry those two policies, fiscal policy and, and monetary policy, that it, is, that it is insane for the federal government to try to manage the economy with these two independent power centers that don't have to talk to each other even in, a, in any real sense. And, and when I say that, I'm fully aware that that's, a, that's another way of saying you have, to, you have to eliminate the independence of the Federal Reserve. But following that up, you, you relate an exchange at a hearing uh, in your book between Senator Byrd and uh, Mr. Volcker, where Senator Byrd asked the question something to the effect of, who are you responsible to? Mr. Volcker responds uh, saying, well, Congress created us. You can uncreate us. If Congress doesn't like what the Fed's doing, can't they do something about it? Sure. 
That, Why I don't mean, they? And, and Volcker, who is a very astute politician, said that with a, with a, a with a little curl in his in his words because he knows perfectly well that Senator Byrd does not have the political power to sell that to Congress, and that and one of the things that played out through the eighties was this struggle of who of who really is going to discipline whom, and uh, in that sense, um, Congress could wipe out the Fed tomorrow. Um, but you've got to put together a, a, a broad enough coalition that wants to do that. And I think unless something very dramatic and violent happened to our society, I think that's not likely. We're talking with William Greider. He's author of Secrets of the Temple, How the Federal Reserve Really Runs Our Country. Uh, the title, Secrets of the Temple, where does that come from? Well, it's an allusion to a theme, a sub-theme that I have throughout the book, which is that money and for that matter, economics has religious properties that are both moral and also metaphysical in a way. And it's not, it's not simply quaint and accidental that money was first coined in the temples of all the classical civilizations. And the Fed, even though it is a very highly rationalistic institution with lots of mathematical equations and economists and so forth, what one would think is that is the opposite of, of religious, actually cloaks itself in, in, in much of the same style and, and thought processes. I mean, the, the, I'll run through just a couple of them. The mystique of the central bank um, is a phrase that the, that's used even by Fed people quite unconsciously of what that suggests, as though there's some mystery going on here. And secondly, um, the Federal Reserve Board uh, though it does it in a prosaic way, has the same role uh, of ancient temple priests, which is that is a prophetic leader that says, this is how we think the future looks. This is what we think will happen to the economy. And, and that's, that's a kind of prophecy making that, that, uh, that the Fed does just as, as, as ancient temples did. 